Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. So good to have you here this morning. So we have five signs left. Today is the first of the second set of signs. And here we find ourselves in chapter 9, beginning in verse 8. And we're going to read verses 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. We'll begin here in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 9. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes from the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Now, I've read to you from the King James. I translated this passage, and for the, my sermon notes, I'd like to read to you from my own translation. And so if you follow along in your copy of God's Word, I think you'll see some differences and some similarities. And I'll point some of those out as we go through here. Beginning now in verse 8, The Lord spoke unto Moses and to Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from the kiln, and Moses will toss them to the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. You notice that he says, I want you to take handfuls of ashes from the kiln. If you've ever messed with ash from a fireplace, that stuff just gets on everything. I remember when Denise and I were first in ministry, our our first uh, pastorate, we lived in a, a parsonage, and they heated the parsonage with a great big uh, fire. Um, it was a standing wood stove there in in the house, and we heated with that in the wintertime. And it didn't matter how clean we were, ash would just get on stuff. And Denise, bless her heart, she was constantly dusting, especially the living room. It was just. You know, because every time you open the door to the to the stove, the, the little puff of air, you know, what a lot, but it would just, and it just floats up. It's so light, and it just kind of goes everywhere. Every year at the end of Sharon Fest, when I close down the grills, the big grill, the one that sits out here, I just shut the lid, you know, and and it just I let it cool because you can't you can't turn that thing off. But the little grill that I use to boil the water. I'll usually carry that off to the side somewhere, away from everybody, and I'll dump the hot coals out on the ground, and then I'll take the hose or, you know, that big uh, stock pot full of water, and I'll just dump it on those coals. Well, I have to be careful because as soon as the water hits the coals, you get that blast of steam, and the steam comes right up with the heat, and then with that, you get this plume of ash. Well, it just goes everywhere, and I'll never forget this. I think it was this last year. I did that, and I watched that little cloud of ash, and I kept praying, Lord, please don't let that drift over onto everybody else's booth. And, of course, it did. It just went straight up, and the wind caught it, and it just went down the line, just straight down the line of all the food booths. And I could just watch it, and it was just kept going and kept going. It was lovely. I'm sure nobody else thought it was lovely, you know. But here's my, here's my garbage now going down on everybody else. It's so light. Uh, it always produces this cloud that it seems just to travel everywhere. I don't know what it is about ash that does that, but that's just its nature. So we have to be careful, especially when I'm at Sharon Fest, about how I put out my fire. And when the wind is blowing, it just takes it. It just it just travels. But even, as I said, in my house in uh, in Hardin County, Kentucky, it, it would just get... I mean, we'd find ash dust on the furniture in the back bedrooms, you know, where it shouldn't be, but there it finds its way. But I want you to notice here in verse 8, it says, take for yourselves handfuls of ashes. Now, the King James reads furnace, but actually this word is better translated from the kiln. Now, it's not just any furnace, but this is the kiln where the ceramics are fired. And in Egypt, that means 
the brick kilns. And when I read that, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? This just isn't an, any old furnace. No, this is the place where the Hebrews are working. This is where they're making brick. So they're making the brick in the brick pits, and then they put them in, in forms and molds. And I've seen this done actually in Israel. They, they'll take the stuff and they put it in molds, and they'll set it out and let it dry. And once it's green enough, then they put it in the kiln and they fire it so that it's hard. Well, here Moses walks by one of these kilns and the Lord says, take some ash. And he just reaches into the back of that that furnace, that kiln, and he just grabs up some of that cold ash that's down there on the bottom. And you know how plentiful that stuff is. He just grabs us up handfuls, you know, of this stuff. And then he carries it with him and he goes in to see Pharaoh. So there's a little bit of justice here, isn't it, in the imagery that would not have been lost on the Hebrews and would not have been lost on the Egyptians and certainly was not lost on Pharaoh. Here comes a Hebrew with a handful of ash from a brick kiln. God takes from the place of their slavery a throwaway item like ash and he says, I've seen all the abuse and I've seen all the hardship and none of it is meaningless to me. Here's going to be a sign that I take from the bottom of the kiln. And I'm going to make it to cover the entire countryside. Just this little handful of ash is so significant. God has not forgotten. God has not forgotten all the people that have lost their lives working in those brick pits and at those kilns. And all the hardship they've suffered and all the abuse that they've taken and all the work that they've had to go through for hundreds of years. Now, here comes the ash. From the brick kiln, and you'll notice that here in this particular in this particular sign, beginning in verse eight, there's some things that we're missing. We don't see anything about a command. There's no "Let my people go that they may serve me." Here, there's nothing like that. It's because this sign is like the sign of the lice. It's a judgment against Pharaoh's refusal to let the people go. So if you go back and you just look at verse seven, Pharaoh said, "You know." Entreat the Lord for me that he might take away the flies. And then in 9, we had the disease on the cattle. And, and Pharaoh said, you know, take that away from me. And, and Moses said, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do that. And then Pharaoh hardens his heart and he goes back on his word. And so just like with the lice, because that was this very kind of judgment. There's no command, let my people go. This is in response to the fact that Pharaoh went back on his word. It's a judgment against his refusal to let the people go. He said he would, but then he didn't. It's a judgment against his sin of not keeping his vow. It's a judgment against his stubborn, godless pride. It's a, it's a judgment against his vow that he didn't keep to let the people go. No command is given with a sign, just like the sign of lice, and we're going to have another one. In a few commands and a few of these signs, it's going to be the sign of darkness. It's another judgment against Pharaoh's refusal. No command is given. And so what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that God judges sin. I don't think we should ever forget that. This is not to say that God's not loving and merciful. Haven't we seen that? Haven't we seen the tomorrows repeated over and over and over? Haven't we seen the warnings? Haven't we seen God say to Pharaoh, just let the people go? He said it over and over and over, and he's given him condition. If you don't, then this is what's going to happen. But I'm going to wait until tomorrow to do it just to give you time to repent. And yet, he doesn't. Here, he doesn't. And God judges Pharaoh's sin. Doesn't give him a chance. He already gave him a chance. He's given him several chances. Don't think that the heavens are brass and that he never knows what's going on in your life. Be careful of taking advantage of his long suffering. Be careful. That never works out and he does not wink at sin. Do not mistake his mercy and his long suffering for the fact that God's okay with your sinning. Because he's not. But my prayer is, God, don't let me take advantage of your mercy. I want to confess my sin, and I want to repent of my sin. I want to work on what we talked about in the catechism this morning. Asking God for the grace of the Spirit to show me my sin, that I might repent of it and turn from it. See, that's the job that we have as believers. 
We don't sin and say, oh, well, it's okay if I sin, and then never turn to God and say, God, help me, I'm a sinner. No, our job is to every day say, Father, my sin is ever before my face. Help me today. Strengthen me today. You cannot have a, a, a slack moment as a believer. You just can't. You have to be on your game and work at it and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Repent of your sins. Mean it. Ask him to give you the strength to walk away from it. And every single one of us has a bosom sin in here. And it's different for every person. We all struggle with something different. All of us do. In a different way, in a different time, in a different style, because we're all individual. But guess what? We have a Holy Ghost that abides in us as believers that knows that and knows exactly what to do to treat that thing. He has a remedy for it. Pharaoh, there was no remedy for Pharaoh except turning to God. He had to do that first, which is what you've done if you're a believer. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've turned to him and you've received pardon and remission of sin. It is completely taken care of. And yet we still struggle in this life because we haven't realized that complete glorification yet. And so we must always come to him and ask him for help, repentance, forgiveness of sin, for mercy, and thank him every day for every victory, no matter how small the victory is. Thank him. Father, I thank you for that. You've given me strength yesterday for that. Now give me strength today for that. Help me now to think about your word more than I think about whatever it might be. Give me strength, Father. Corral my mind. Bridle my heart. I give you permission today to do that over that nastiness that so bothers me as a believer. That's what we need to do. God judges sin. And if we plow through this life and act like he's never going to judge our sin, act like it's okay for us to do whatever in the world we think we're going to do, that is a mistake, especially for the believer, because he has his eye on you closer than anyone else. One of the wonders of preaching through the signs in Exodus Is just that. We see both God's mercy and we see his judgment. God is long-suffering with Pharaoh and is merciful towards him, and yet we see him judging Pharaoh. Notice verse 9 now. Again, I'm reading from my own translation. And it will become a powder upon the land of Egypt, and it will become an eruption upon man and beast breaking out in boils in the land of Egypt. Now, this is different from dust. The, the, I think the King James has here a small dust. It's, this is more than a small dust. This is like a powder. This is like, ladies, like the powder that you have in your makeup kit, you know, or the powder, the talc that you have in your bathroom medicine cabinet or something. It's that powder that's really fine. So it goes from a dust that's really fine to a powdery substance that was very fine and very light. And this powdery stuff, it went upon the entire land of Egypt. This language here suggests that this fine powder behaves like the ash, and it stays aloft longer and travels farther when launched into the air. And, of course, that's what Moses is about to do. And, and notice now, this one handful, he's just reached down at the back of some kiln, and pulled up a handful of ash. He walks in before Pharaoh, doesn't say a word, and just does that. Just tosses it right up into the air. That one handful becomes powder that covers the nation. Now that right there, by itself, is the first miraculous thing about the ash. The second thing about the ash is that it produces an eruption which is a boy, which breaks out into a boil. So he took the ash from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses tossed it to the heavens, and it became an eruption of boils breaking out on man and beast. So I got to thinking, what, what is exactly a boil? I mean, I think I know, but I went to Tabor's Cyclopedic Medical Dictionary, the 12th edition, and uh, this used to belong to my sister, and she gave it to me. She got a, a newer edition, so she said, hey, you want this? And I, of course, did because what a great sermon illustrations I could get out of a encyclopedic medical dictionary. There's a lot of things in the Bible that, 
uh, talk about these kind of issues. And so I pulled down my, my Tabor's last night, and I was looking at the Tabor's, and I saw this about boils. The deeper tissue inflammation is so severe that blood clots in the vessels and the center dies. This is the cause of the acuteness of the pain. The dead core is ultimately expelled or reabsorbed. And contrary to general opinion, boils do not arise from bad blood, but are the result of a local infection due to an invasion of streplococci. Streplococcus. Some boils erupt due to the presence of a parasitic protozoa. None of that sounds fun to me. I don't know about you. But one of the translations given for this idea of boil that I discovered was that it was possibly leprous. So this dust traveling all over the land, and suddenly they would have a place on their skin and would just explode into the, to this boil, this leprous boil, probably on the face, on the arms, on the body, who knows where, maybe all over. And can you imagine the pain? And the, well, you know the rest. It's, it's not fun to have that kind of thing. And so these boils now are erupting on everyone, not just the men, but also the animals. Everybody's got it. And this dust is the thing that's causing it. It's just everywhere. And so, again, remember, this is fine powder. It's, a, it's like that ash from the back of the kiln and just goes everywhere. And it's covering not only the land, but it's covering the houses. It's in the houses. It's on the people. It's on the animals. It's, in the, it's on everything. And so they can't escape it. That one little handful becomes a powder that covers the land, and it causes them to break out into these boils It cause can't imagine the pain and the the debilitating nature of that. Now, you'll notice here that he took the ash from the kiln, stood before Pharaoh and Moses, tossed it to the heavens, and it became an eruption of boils breaking out on man and beast. Notice that the sin of the prince doesn't just affect the prince, because this is a judgment on Pharaoh not letting the people go. But it pours over onto his people. Don't ever forget that sin has consequences, but not just for you. Sin has consequences for those within your orbit. These people are suffering. They're suffering because the prince won't let them go. But, oh, no, I think there's something more here. I think they're suffering not for anything that they've done, except their complicity in enslaving the children of Jacob. They're not suffering for anything that they've done except their complicity in murdering the male children. They're not suffering for anything that they've done except for the harsh treatment of the Egyptian taskmasters over the Hebrew slaves. Oh yes, every Egyptian has seen or done all of these things and is complicit in the sin of not letting the people go. So sin affects Everyone in your orbit, but ladies and gentlemen, everybody in Pharaoh's orbit was complicit in this sin as well. So don't tell me that they are innocents. Well, they're not. They're in it with him. It is not their sin that is being judged, but they are not innocent of this sin. Pharaoh has set the table for the prejudice that is rife in that community, and they are suffering because they're a part of it with him. They have given their thumbs up to having the Hebrew slaves and keeping them in Egypt. Verse 11, Then the magicians were not able to stand before Moses because of the presence of the eruption. For the eruption was on the magicians and all the Egyptians. The magicians are the first ones. The people and Pharaoh, you know, they're the ones that uh, see that their magic wielders are the first ones to suffer because they're standing against Moses as he addresses Pharaoh. Can't you just see Moses and Aaron walk into that courtroom? And as soon as they walk into that courtroom and they appear before Pharaoh, here the magicians come out and line up because, you know, of course, they're doing battle with magicians and they're the ones that have created the serpent and they're the ones that made the water red and they're the ones that created the frogs. Of course, they failed with the lice. And they told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But they're, oh, they're still there. They're doing their job. They line up against Moses. And as soon as that ash hits the air and it becomes fine powder and it spreads out through all the land of Egypt, they're the first ones that get it because they're right there. What can the arm of flesh do? Nothing. 
Dependence on the magic or luck or traditions or idols or gods and all the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, what, is that, what good does that do for the magicians? Not a thing. What good does that do for Pharaoh? Not a thing. What good does that do for the people? Not a thing. All that we do, our magic, our luck, and our traditions, we make it into our own supernatural soup that God delights to strip away from us like a bandage that's been on the flesh too long. It hurts, but it needs to come off if you're going to get better. And he's stripping away this bandage of idolatry that so marks the Egyptian people. And he begins right here with the ones who are the most heavy-handed at it, and that is these magicians. They think they've, they can depend on their gods. Guess what? Their gods are nothing but idols. And then Pharaoh, you notice there in verse 12, says, So the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to them, according to what the Lord, according to what the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, wait a minute. Listen to them. Who spoke to Pharaoh? Nobody. Not in this judgment, not in this sign. Nothing was said to Pharaoh. There was no, let my people go that they may serve me. None of that. There was no Egyptian magician saying to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But I guarantee you, as Pharaoh watched the events of this sign unfold with the magicians first and then the rest of the Egyptian nation, including himself and including his wife and including his family... He was thinking of all the times that they had said to him, let the people go. So when it says he would not listen to them, he's remembering all the times that someone had said. And there are plenty of times. We have them recorded for us all through this experience all the way up to right now. Plenty of times that Pharaoh was listening. He sees there's no hope in the help from the magicians. He sees there's no hope in his own soul. He sees there's no relief coming from his gods. He sees there's no wise counselor to succor the great king. But still his heart is hardened against the word of the Lord. That's another result of sin. That's another result of vow breaking. That's another result of backsliding. That's another result of refusing to bow before the great God of all the universe. A hardened heart. And so Pharaoh, his heart has hardened by himself. It's hardened by the Lord. And how's it hardened by the Lord? Simply by his word. Being spoken to this man who would not Look, no, don't, don't pass by those words, those simple words right there in 12. Would not listen. So many people are hearing the word preached today, but they will not listen. Because the word of the Lord will be glorified. He is glorified. His word above all his name. And he watches over his word to perform it. Listening, ladies and gentlemen is a good practice. And so Pharaoh's heart is hardening. Again, I've said it before. I'll say it again. His heart is what's in view here. Pharaoh's heart, if we could put it in a jar and set it on the pulpit and just every Sunday have a look, we're watching what happens with Pharaoh's heart. And that's what the passage is doing. It's watching what's happening with Pharaoh's heart. And it's getting harder and harder and harder. And Pharaoh's hardening, and the word of the Lord is hardening, and all of his experiences are hardening because he will not bow his knee to the Lord. So how do we apply this? Well, I think it's very simple, isn't it? First of all, today, don't think you have to be a super Christian and be sinless to be walking with Christ, because you don't. But what you have to be is diligent. You have to be bowing your knee before him and repenting of sin daily. And You have to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, that you are not complicit and engaging others in your own sin and the judgment against it. Because what you do will have an effect on others. And then, how are you responding to the Word of God? I think the reason why we don't read more of the Word and the reason why we're not engaged more daily with the Word is because it hurts. It cuts to the quick. And it has a result, it has an effect. 
We need that. We need this medicine every day. We need to be applying it to our hearts every day and reading the word every day. Don't give up on it. Don't stop. Now you say, well, I've, I've kind of fallen off the wagon in that. Well, that's okay. Climb back on board. Go someplace familiar. Go someplace that you've been before and read again. Start over. Just keep at it. Don't give up. Allow the word of the Lord to have its softening effect because if you don't, it'll have a hardening effect. That's what it's having with Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't want to hear it. He didn't want to, he didn't want to think about it, but he couldn't, he couldn't keep himself from thinking about it because he would not listen. Oh, God, give us tender hearts. I think that's the prayer that we ought to be praying. Oh, God, give us tender hearts. Let us see our own sinfulness. Let us repent of our own sinfulness. Let us run to you every single day. Let us look into your word and apply it to ourselves every day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the lesson of Pharaoh and the ash from the kiln. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.